I think it's important that we blast ourselves back to the 90s to understand a little bit more about what makes Final Fantasy X so special. In the late 90s, Square was on a roll. From Final Fantasy VI to IX, they were cranking out hits. Back to back to back to back. And while the overworlds and battle systems were mostly similar with some unique twists here or there, the narrative of each was its own special little story. With 7, 8, and 9 all being on the PlayStation, there was one problem. I didn't own a PlayStation. My parents had bought me the Nintendo 64, so I actually didn't know Final Fantasy existed yet. And while my best friend Ryan would come over and play Zelda The Ocarina of Time or Jet Force Gemini on my N64, I would go to his house because he owned a PlayStation 1. I remember being so excited to show him my favorite game of all time, Chrono Trigger, and he in turn was excited to show me his favorite game something called Final Fantasy VII. And from that point on, I would become enamored with the worlds of Final Fantasy. The gameplay was pretty simple. You'd move along a narrative story, you would traverse an overworld, and while traveling, you would get into a random battle encounter. You could end it really quickly by rapidly smashing X to just spam attacks until the fight's over, or sit back, relax, and watch a really long anime attack deal tons of damage to finish the fight. And that would take you right back where you left off, free to move on forward with the story in the world. And it had stayed that way, from Final Fantasy VI through IX. But much to the chagrin of Final Fantasy fans, the core gameplay was about to change forever. Final Fantasy X didn't just take me to a new world, it took Final Fantasy to a new world. One in which all the gameplay that we knew would forever be gone, for better or worse. First and foremost, the Final Fantasy franchise is known for its characters and its stories. You join Titus, or Titus, whatever you want to call him, on his journey through the world of Spira, as he joins Summoner Yuna and her guardians on their pilgrimage to defeat an immensely powerful monster known as Sin. But soon you realize Sin isn't the only problem plaguing Spira as twists and turns ensue. Final Fantasy is also known for its musical scores, and Final Fantasy X doesn't just have one of my favorite Final Fantasy soundtracks, it has one of my favorite soundtracks in all of video gaming. Each song fitting the mood so well, from the heavy tones of Overworld to the plucking tunes of Villages and somber tones of Xanarkand, the music really helps set an emotional scene. The overworld in which we had become accustomed to, where we would walk around and bump into enemies, was dropped. Now you were given a linear path, an extremely beautiful one, and one where you could still have random enemy encounters. Or you could bump into a random old man who will tell you the lore of the world. And honestly, that's something I came to love about Final Fantasy X. Sure, the core gameplay can be distilled into look at the minimap and just follow the trail, but you'd miss the interactables. The treasure chests, the Albed primers, the random bits of lore you can read around the world. It's more than just a hallway you can follow along with. What could just be hallways and corridors are instead beautiful scenes, and Final Fantasy X excels in visual storytelling. The world has so much to offer and all you have to do is look at it to learn from it. Just look at how the cast sits around in this cozy room, and look at what the room holds. Ice picks, ice skates, polar bear skin. It tells you about the region you're in, and the way everyone sits tells you how they're feeling. And the hallways of Spira are littered with NPCs. They'll help move the plot forward, but also fill out the world's lore and make it feel alive. Whether it's the Chocobo Knights, the Old Historian, other summoners, or the plethora of random NPCs that you can bump into once or many times throughout the story, you'll feel like this is a real living, breathing world. And one of my favorite examples of this is the shoe puff. And you wonder, what's a shoe puff? And everyone has these delightful little stories about their interactions with the shoe puff. Yuna having fun jumping into the water, Kamari being worried about Yuna but being happy that she's having a good time, Orin telling Titus about how his father Jekt was so drunk once that he actually grabbed his weapon and struck the shoe puff. And you can still see the scar on the shoe puff and another bit of visual storytelling. And it also tells us about Jekt and his interactions with Orin in the past. And it gives us a glimpse into why Titus hates his father. You can walk into the little shelter and listen to the differences between Waka and Lulu and see a map as well as an art depiction of the shoe puff in the background. We view the world of fish out of water through the same lens as Titus. And with that lens, they show us a lot. Storytelling wise, they hit you on all fronts. Square did an excellent job of making Spira feel like a real living world. But they also did a great job of making the characters feel like they're alive in this world, a part of it, interacting with it. 
The story is told not only through the world, but how the characters live in it. And as a child, I remember being enamored with this, just sitting there in awe at the world of Spira and all its characters and all of its lore, and even 20 years on, it, I still feel the same way. I couldn't wait to just see what happens next, the story was always moving. What is Sin? How can they possibly defeat a monstrosity of such apocalyptic power and strength? The hardships everyone in the party has to go through, everyone has their own story, their own tragedy. I couldn't help but wonder, how is it going to be solved, what's next for these people? But the way Square handles their worlds wasn't the only thing that had changed about Final Fantasy. The wait for your little active time gauge to fill up and then attack system was gone. And Final Fantasy X brought in instead an initiative order, one that could be changed based on spells you cast or attacks you have, as well as ones that the enemy can do, constantly shifting the flow of battle. But the initiative system also meant you didn't have to act as soon as possible. The enemy wasn't going to make a move, not until its turn in the initiative had come. Battles themselves became a bit of a rock-paper-scissor system in which you'll on the fly switch through party members to maximize your ability to kill the enemy. And while the regular encounters can be a bit dull and grindy at times, the game does offer a lot of difficult challenges in terms of fights. Boss fights that ask you to strategize, to think critically to win the fight, where you can't just rock, paper, scissors your way out. And instead of just gaining experience and leveling up, they made the level up system interactive as well. What appears to be a linear sphere grid where you march forward through your character's skill tree to level up here and there with spheres as you gain experience is actually kind of fun, because you can break your characters out of their molds. Little locks block your path, and if you want, you can turn Titus from a time mage to a white mage. You can turn Waka into a beater just like Orin, or if you wanted, you could make him a black mage like Lulu. Some people even go above and beyond and fill out the entire sphere grid for every character, which I don't think I have the sanity to do, but props to them. But battles aren't the only part of gameplay. <sighs> There's also the Cloister of Trials. A good idea. I think the cloisters could have been fun, and I think for some people they are fun. For me, they were often a very slow, tedious, repetitive mess as you slog forward to get the destruction spheres needed for the secret unlockables as well as the Aeon at the end to summon, but you also have to do it to move the story forward, and in some cases, such as the Bevel Temple, I was at my wit's end. Honestly, the one thing I was really hoping for out of a remaster was some changes to the Cloister of Trials, especially, especially the Bevel. I forgot how bad the Bevel Cloister of Trials truly is. While making this video, I've been playing Final Fantasy X, and honestly, this is the most fucking annoying bullshit part of the game by far. The repetitive music, the shitty controls, going a little nuts. And Final Fantasy is also known for its mini-games, whether it's the great arcade games of Final Fantasy 7, Triple Triad and 8, Tetra Master and 9. We've become accustomed to having a little fun game to keep us occupied, a break from the story here and there. And Final Fantasy X has Blitzball, a form of aquatic rugby, kind of, but also soccer. You could also say it's just water polo, but underwater exclusively, and everyone can hold their breath forever. It's... it's hard to explain. But what really matters is that its theme fits the world perfectly. And surprisingly, the lore of Blitzball is heavily worked into the main story. The people of Spira have one common form of recreation, and that's Blitzball. Most of the world may be island inhabitants one bad day away from the apocalypse, but they all get together and bond over this one sport. It's also one of the few bits of Machina that their religion Yevin allows, really showing how important it is to their people in the world. Blitzball as a minigame has its fair share of problems. It can be annoying, tedious, grindy, but there's some fun to be had in building your team, leveling them up, trading, and working your way to the top. Another change to Final Fantasy was the voice bubbles. You're serious? Voice acting had been brought to Final Fantasy for the first time. And honestly, it probably wasn't the best possible execution. There's times where the voice acting is sped up to match the animation or slowed down. Sometimes the delivery is a little off. And it at times feels directionless, as if you're not listening to a conversation between two people, but two people speaking in their own room, not knowing the scene itself or how it's meant to be interacted with. 
Leaving the overworld of free exploration, dropping the long-used active time battle system, an awkward first attempt at voice acting, Final Fantasy X changed a lot about the Final Fantasy franchise and its formula. And going forward, every Final Fantasy was going to be very different from the last. 10 through 15 are all extremely different from each other. And for a lot of people, after 10, the magic was lost. Many people will look back and point the finger at 10 being the first one to deviate. Listen, I get it, these changes aren't for everyone. A lot of people are gonna miss the active time battle system. A lot of people are gonna miss the overworld, walking around, exploring, finding things. They're gonna hate the hallways and corridors, no matter how much you dress them up, or how many NPCs there are, or how much visual storytelling you cram into it. The precepts must be obeyed! Like I care! And to their credit, they've done the best they can to make it appealing for those people. And that's something I've noticed about Final Fantasy X. It's made to be appealing to a new audience. It's on a new PlayStation and it's trying to get new fans. When looking at it, I can honestly say I think it's one of the best Final Fantasy games for somebody who's never played Final Fantasy to start with. Whether it's the older graphics or the confusion of gameplay, some of the older Final Fantasies can be really difficult for somebody who's never played an RPG or a Final Fantasy game to get into. But Final Fantasy X will grab your attention, demand it, and kind of lead you along this trail of a story. And I found it to be a really enjoyable change of pace from the last few Final Fantasy games. But not too much has changed, as a lot of Final Fantasy staples make their return. You have your lovable party driving the narrative, a beautiful, well-crafted world filled to the brim with lore, staple monsters make their return, including chocobo, tonberries, and a whole host of others. Summons are here as always, the magic that you've come to know and love, ultimate weapons, in this case called celestial weapons, that are a huge pain in the ass to grind for, but once you get them, you deal an insane amount of damage, and an incredibly hard side boss that you don't need to beat, but it does show your dedication to the game when you do beat them. A lot of what makes Final Fantasy, Final Fantasy is still around. Looking back, Final Fantasy X is a weird game. In every possible way other than the Cloister of Trials, I love Final Fantasy X. I love this game. 20 plus years on, from a child to a grown man, I still have fun and I still experience that childlike wander. And it's a Final Fantasy for me. And with 15 main entries in the franchise and more coming, there's probably going to be a Final Fantasy for everyone out there, it's just a matter of finding it. I know 10 won't be for everyone, but personally it aligns with a lot of what I love in video games and media. Not to mention growing up near the beach, my love of the ocean, it just kinda ticks a lot of boxes for me. It'll be fun! What do you say, huh? Come on! Come on! If you've never played Final Fantasy X, I think it's a leap worth taking. I think it's worth trying to play, especially if you can find it on sale. Sure, it's an older game and it can be wonky at times, but it's made with a lot of love and care. It's a game I love so much that I spent one week last October making a costume for Halloween. And I might be a bit biased, but my hope is that this video shows you that despite its downsides and despite the changes it brought to Final Fantasy, it's a fun game. Especially if you love narrative-driven games and lovingly crafted worlds. I'd love to hear what you guys think about Final Fantasy X if you've played it, as well as how you view it among the other Final Fantasy games. Thanks for watching everyone, see ya!